Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just worship you. You're such an amazing God. Thank you that you're a God of truth and that your truth sets us free. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will move in this place today, that you will linger with every heart. Lord, that you will come this morning and set us free from the lies that wants to keep us in bondage and that you will set us free with your love. Thank you that we can spend time in your word and your word brings light to our path and we honor you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to speak to you on the topic from failure to life. Can I please see the hands of the people who have never failed before? Oh, there you go. Okay. Wonderful, we've got one of those. I said in the previous service, there might be a guy pumping his wife in the ribs and say, you're never wrong. Put up your hand. <laughs> See, we all fail. I'm speaking to the right crowd. We all fail at times. But there can be life after failure. Many times people give up when they fail, and that is not God's plan for us. Now, I want to use a piece of scripture that's very well known. It is from Genesis 4, and it speaks of Cain and Abel. Now, you might say, I've heard this story since I've been yay high, but I believe there are many lessons for us to learn from this story on how to fail or not to fail. Lessons from the life of Cain. Now, as a backstory, we know that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, perfectly connected with God. Can you imagine that? Imagine living in a space where there's no pain, no fear. God supplies everything you need. You're in constant connection with the God of heaven and earth. And then by a choice of rebellion, being cut off from that, And having to move into a distorted system, not the way that God planned it. Going into this different world that is now impacted by sin and death and trouble and heartache, all because of your choice. How horrible that had to be. It will never be the same again. Yet God was gracious that in the midst of the when he... um, Cursed the serpent, God gave a prophecy of hope as well. He said that one day from the seed of the woman, there would come one who would crush the head of the serpent. One that would break the power of darkness and sin. And as such, we see that in Genesis 4, Eve conceived her first child and they called him Cain. And his name means possession or virtue. Because she said, I received a man-child from God. Now the thought must have crossed their minds. Maybe he is the one. Maybe he is the one that's going to crush the head of the enemy. Maybe he is the one that's going to restore everything to the way it was. And maybe that was what the enemy thought as well. And I think he was gunning for Cain. Because he thought, I cannot let this man succeed. Maybe he is the one. But then as Cain grows up by his actions, we see that he was not the child of prophecy. Now after Cain, Abel was born. And in this first generation, we see the horrific effect of sin on humanity. Those who were made in the image of God was distorted by envy and hate, resulting in the first murder. But before this, before the first murder, we see that Cain made other mistakes in his life as well. And when looking at his life and what he did, we can see a blueprint of how not to respond to failure or how we should respond to failure. In fact, God brings hope into the story many times, and it gives Cain the guidelines of how to deal with failure if he would only listen. We will also see that after failure, there is still hope. It is not the end. It's how you react on failure that has a massive effect on your future 
and on your life. So let's get into the text. If you've got your Bible with you, you can read with me from Genesis 4, verse 1. You can also go on the app to the Bible section, and the tab will be open there for you. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain, came before, Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He, God, said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you're cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his first son. God bless his wonderful word to our hearts. So we see firstly that we need to fail rightly. Fail rightly. Now you might say, this is a strange phrase. How can failure be right? Failure is not right, but how you respond to failure is a choice. You can choose to respond right after failure or respond wrong after failure. After every failure, there's a fork in the road. You have a choice to respond the way God wants you to respond and let him lead you into something beautiful. Or you can choose wrong, which will lead you to a second failure. But every time there's a failure, there's a fork in the road. We can choose while we respond to God. Now we read that Abel was a keeper of the flocks. And Cain was a tiller of the ground. And they both brought an offering to God. And God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Now, there are many commentaries on this section. The one commentary um, people say it might mean or why it happened is that Abel brought a type of Jesus, the lamb that would be slain for the sins of the world. He brought an animal sacrifice. But Cain brought a grain offering, not an animal sacrifice. And that's why God rejected his offering. Now, there is a certain truth to this because the animal sacrifice points to Christ and his perfect work. But we see later that God tells Israel that they have to bring grain offerings as well. So it wasn't just about the grain offering. There was something more. I believe we know that God, Hebrews 11 says that Abel brought an offering through faith and Cain did not. That's why God accepted his offering. So Abel's heart could have been, God, you are the one that grows this flock. 
You are the one that makes them lamb. You are the one that gives them grass to eat. You are the one that gives them water. You are the source. It is all you. Where Cain, by the sweat of his brow, was tiling, he, he, he was working hard. He was harvesting and he was plowing and he was doing all these things and he saw the work of his hands come up. And then he comes to God and say, God, look at what I have done. So whatever it was, whatever was in his heart, we see that God did not accept his offering. So in effect, Cain failed. He failed because he did not bring the offering that God desired. But there's a lesson in this, that failure is not the end. We read, though, that Cain got very angry when God did not receive his offering. He became annoyed. He became hostile. The fact of the matter was that he did something wrong. But instead of humbly repenting and asking for guidance, he became angry. I love God's response to this. In verse 6, six God's response says, why are you angry? Why are you sullen? Why are you hostile? Why are you annoyed? God is actually asking him, why are you angry after failure? You did not do it right. You did not please me, but why are you angry? See, many people get stuck in anger. When they do something wrong, they get angry. Have you seen that before? Someone does something wrong and immediately they're angry. It's weird. Instead of coming to a place to say, where did I go wrong? They shift it and say, I didn't do anything wrong. Some of you, if you're a bit older, you might remember a tennis player with the name of John McEnroe. <laughs> Enough said, let's go on. <laughs> See, John McEnroe was a brilliant tennis player. He was a champion. He uh, won many Grand Slams. He won Wimbledon. He did all those wonderful things, but he had a character flaw. He had a chink in his armor. He was rebellious and angry. So if a linesman would call a ball out or the umpire would call the ball out, he would throw a fit. He would take his racket and throw it around. He would shout at them, tell them that they're idiots. They don't know what they're doing. He knew better. Here's the thing. The umpire never gave in to his tantrums. Out was out. In was in. Rules were rules. His personal opinion did not affect the rule. His perception of the truth could not change the truth. And we need to know and we need to recognize that we are not the ones deciding what is wrong and right. Thank God. Imagine every person just deciding for himself what is wrong and right. That is exactly where the humanistic system of this world is going. But the end of that is, is that there is no rule. There is no law. I can walk up to you and slap you and you cannot tell me it's wrong because I decided it's right. You see, we do not decide what is wrong and right. God does. He is the umpire. He's the one that sets up what is wrong and right, what is right. But here's the beautiful thing. God doesn't write us off, discard us, and throw us away when we make mistakes. However, he doesn't want us to get angry, but he wants us to be teachable on how to do it right. Yet people's anger many times keep them from this. And I believe the reason for the anger is a deep-seated insecurity. It's an insecurity of my worth. What am I worth? The moment that I do something wrong, I am worth less. People take their lives as a math equation. As soon as I do something good, my worth grows. When I do something wrong, my worth diminishes. And we all want to be worth something. We all would love to be a hundred percent. But every time that I make a mistake, the percentage comes down. 
I will never reach 100% because one mistake, one mistake makes you less than 100%. Even if I get to 99.9999998%, I will never be perfect on this earth. See, people tend to grade themselves. And every time they fail, they give themselves an F for failure. And many determine their worth based on their actions. I am what I do. It becomes an extension of who they are. So if I fail, the internal message is not that I failed. It becomes I am a failure. And there's a big difference because the moment I feel like a failure, I get angry. Who made these rules? See, it becomes a warped idea of um, that I do not want to repent. I do not want to say I'm sorry because if I repent and say I'm sorry, then I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, then my worth is less. I become less of a person. This stirs a deep Frustration and anger because I never feel good enough. The problem with this is the definition of our worth. What do I base my worth on? This morning I want to tell you, your worth is not in what you do, it's in who you are in Christ. Your worth is in what God sees in you, the worth that He has attached to you. You are made in the image of God and your worth is in that. That is why Jesus had to die. No gold and silver could buy you back because you were made in the image of God. Something godly had to be given in return. That's why Jesus had to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Our worth is not in what we do. And this is why our, our, our successes or our failures contribute to our growth or lack of growth, but not our worth. And this is why God can use even failures as teaching moments. Do you know we don't only learn from doing things right? We learn from doing things wrong as well. If you don't believe me, go to your stovetop this afternoon, put on the gas and put your hands in the flames. Quickly you will find out that doing something stupid, you can learn from that as well. Here's a good illustration. A self-guided missile on its way to its target doesn't fly true 100% of the time. That missile makes thousands of mistakes, even though it, is, it, it might even just be a percentage of a degree going off course. It has to correct all the time to make sure that it reaches its target. There might be a wind from the side. So, oh, I'm going off course. I'm failing, let's come back. See, failure might be part of our correction. Failure is part of our journey. It happens. We are not perfect. It's like when you drive. Every time you drive, you are correcting to stay on the road. If a turn to the right comes, you need to correct into it. Otherwise, you will fail miserably. The thing is, if we fail and we don't learn from it, we are bound to repeat the same mistake. We stay on course by correcting mistakes. That's part of our growth as Christians. And here's the thing, I've got news for you. None of us are perfect. And you will never be perfect on this earth. We do grow in maturity into the image of Christ. And we grow by changing what we do wrong, by surrendering it to Him. And this is why God has grace towards us. His grace and His love determines our worth. I will build my life upon your love. It is my firm foundation. My worth does not fluctuate in God's eyes when I make a mistake or I do something great. He still loves me the same. 
It's his heart for us, though, that we should not keep on failing. He encourages us to try again. 1 John 1, 9, we know this by heart. If we confess our sins, or if we confess our failures, he is faithful, he is righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. By implication, that means let's do this again. Let's try again. Because failure can be turned around. In verse 6, God tells him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? God is telling him that this is not the end. This mistake of your offering did not define you. If you at first fail, try again. I've got good news for you this morning. Failure in most areas can be turned around. If you feel like a failure in your marriage, it can be turned around. If you feel like a failure as a parent, it can be turned around. If you feel like a failure in your job, it can be turned around. It is not the end. Here's the thing. Don't get stuck in the failure. Don't stay there. Don't say, this is who I am. Many people are in a place where they say, this is how I was made. This is who I am. I'm going to die like this. I won't change. That's not God's heart for us. God's heart for us is a beautiful life. Don't repeat the cycle. We read this in John 8 verse 10 and 11, where Jesus, the woman that was um, caught in adultery, is brought to Jesus. And Jesus tells her, after her accusers go, tells her, I do not condemn you either. Go. But he doesn't stop with a go. He says, from now on, sin no more. Now, what does this mean? Because all of us sin, all of us struggle. Even if this lady, she might have even just gotten angry with someone. The point is, Jesus is telling her, from now on, do not habitually go on doing the things you were doing. Turn around. Stop the cycle. It's not my heart for you. We read in 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if you sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's not God's heart that we should sin. But if we fail, it's definitely not God's heart that we should throw in the towel and say, I'm done with this. Now, Cain brought the wrong offering. He brought it the wrong way. It would be pointless to try and do it the same way again the next day. He needed correction. He needed God's guidance and counsel. There's this saying that's attributed to Albert Einstein that says, you cannot do the same thing again and expect a different result. That's insanity. We also cannot turn our failure around on our own. We need wisdom and guidance from God. Why? Because in the end, self-effort will drain you. We need to be connected to the source of life. You cannot sustain yourself indefinitely. You need the strength of the Holy Spirit indwelling to change and manifest into navigating a successful life. And there's no better one to go to than God. He is the one that made us. His counsel is perfect. He knows what we need to do to be the most effective and to turn our failures around. But then God gives him another warning. There's a second part to this. And God tells him, sin crouches at the door. In verse 7, verse 6, we see if you do well, you'll be accepted. Verse 7, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now, there's something that I can deduce from this text. God was not angry with him after failure. How do I know this? Because when he failed, God didn't tell him, you useless idiot. What did you do? You will never make it. You are damned for eternity. No. 
God brings a word of courage and asks an introspective question, and then God gives him a choice and the consequence to each choice. First, an introspective question. Why are you angry? And then God says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. If you don't, sin is crouching and it wants to destroy you. In every situation, we have free will. We have a choice how to respond. When the fork in the road comes, we can choose how to respond. And this is the theme all throughout the Bible. We see that when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, he told the, the, the nation of Israel, he said in 1 Kings 18, 21, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Deuteronomy 30, 15, God says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity or death and adversity. Do you believe that God's plan for you is life and prosperity? That's God's heart for us. And in prosperity, I'm not talking about monetary riches. That's not the point. Jesus said, I came to bring life and life in abundance. Knowing God, living in his statutes, following his heart brings life. That brings prosperity. But if I choose death, it brings anxiety and adversity. God's heart is always the heart of a good father. He wants his children to make the right choices and to lead them in it. Still, sin is crouching and wants to destroy us. And here's the thing. Sin has consequences. The first original sin Adam and Eve did was shunning God. Shunning his love, his counsel, his way of living. I'll do it my way. My will be done. Rebellion and defiance. And I'm sure that Cain knew the story. I'm sure his mom and dad, maybe at bedtime, told him, you know what? We were in this wonderful place, connected with God. Everything was perfect. And then we made a stupid decision. He knew the story. I believe that Cain knew that sin for him would be to follow his carnal nature of doing it his own way, doing what he saw fit, what he saw as right. And I think maybe even he had this distorted idea in his heart that, you know what, there's only two of us. It's only Abel and me. So if there's no competition, by default, I'm the winner. Something grew in his heart. Why did he have to kill his brother? Whatever it was, God saw this and God warned him. We have the same warning this morning. We have the warning that sin carries its own penalty and consequences in this life. We can see it all around us. When people follow the root of sin, there's heartache and there's pain. And it is the natural outflow of the sin, whatever it is. Defying God, running away from his will, brings death. Here's the thing. God is life. So if I'm inclined towards God, I'm moving towards life. If I run away from God and turn from God, by default, I'm going to death. God is light. If I'm inclined towards God and what he does, I move towards light. If I turn around, I run to darkness. It's not God's heart for you, but it is a choice that you can run into death. And see, many people have these accusations against God. Why is God so angry? Why does God do these things? Why is the penalty for sin so hard? Why do God condemn people to hell? It is the natural consequence of sin. Say, for example, you have kids and you live on a very busy road. So you set up a rule. Kids, you're not allowed to play in the street. It's a law in the house. Why? 
because you love your kids. You don't want them to get hurt. You're not trying to be a spoil sport. You just know the penalty that will come from it. So say one day you're not at home and your kids say, dad doesn't know what he's talking about. We know what we can do. We can play ball anywhere. So they take the ball and go and play in the street. And a reckless driver drives too fast and cannot stop in time and hits one of the kids. Was it the fault of the law? Was it the fault of the rule? Was it the father's heart? No, it was the choice of the child that carries the penalty of what happens. Now say that you are in your house and you see your kids are defying what you're saying. You see through the window there's a car coming. So you run out and you shove your child out of the way and the car hits you. This is what Jesus did. He saw the penalty for sin. He saw what breaking the law, breaking God's rule would do. It would kill us. And he came and he stood in our place. He took the penalty for sin. Because there is destructive consequences to sin built into our sin. It is not God's heart for you. It's not his choice. And this is why he keeps on warning. And his warning continues with Cain and with us as well. We need to master the sin. Because the thing with sin, it has the effect that it takes us into the wrong thought pattern. The battle is here. The battle is in the mind and in the heart. There's a scripture in Jeremiah 79 that says, The heart of man is deceitful above all else. We can not trust our hearts. Because our hearts can try and turn this thing so that it looks like a good idea. That's what the heart does. So what the heart does with this emotion of guilt is instead of coming to a place of surrender, many people rationalize it into two areas. First of all, they try and maybe blame someone else. It's not my fault I slapped you. You made me angry. It's your fault. It's not my fault. Rationalize it. Or rationalize that it is the fault of the one that made the law. Mr. Officer, why are you catching me? This is a stupid law driving 25 miles per hour. What's this all about? It's the law's fault. It's not my fault rationalizing the heart is deceitful it is not the law that hurts you it is the breaking of the law and that's why God says sin is crouching in verse 7 he says but you must master it Cain had a choice he could either brood over his failure and then rationalize to himself that I actually did nothing wrong it was my brother he's the problem or God God is the problem. It's not me. Or he could come in agreement with God and say, yes, God, I did something wrong. I don't really understand it. Teach me your way. Show me. I want to repent. And from this failure, I can grow. And this is the choice we also have. Instead of trying to rationalize our innocence and putting this defense of anger on, we can lay down our weapon of anger, acknowledge our fault, and grow through it. Romans 12, 21 echoes this again. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Evil wants to overcome you. Evil wants to fan the flames of anger. Evil wants to pump you up in your defiance until you're in a place where you are overrun by your anger and your defiance and you are giving over to it. That's not God's heart. God wants us to overcome evil with good. And sometimes that is not easy. It's not easy to come in humility and repent. It's not easy to say, God, I'm wrong. It's not easy to say, I have a problem. There's a fault. 
I have sinned. It's not easy to do the right thing always. But the thing is, if we do not do it, guilt and anger and frustration and stress and worry starts to weigh so heavy that you cannot carry it anymore. Because deep down, you know something's wrong. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. See, my yoke is light. We have a choice to come in under Christ's yoke. That means that he is the one that takes, we take, um, we take our counsel from him. We learn from him. We focus on his leading. And when we do this, we have the wonderful privilege that we don't have to do this alone. When I surrender to God, he says, I give my spirit that comes to live inside you. And he becomes the counselor. He becomes the power. He becomes the one you rest on to change. He's the one that will enable you to do this. If you stop defying me, stop being angry and surrender to my spirit. He has this wonderful, wonderful promise. Philippians 2, verse 13. It's wrong in the notes, by the way. It says 2, 3. It was a typo. 2, 13 says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will. God, I struggle with my will. I can change that, God says. And to work. God, I wanna, don't want to do this. My human nature don't want to do this. I want to be rebellious. He says, hey, surrender to me. I can even change that. To will and to work for his good pleasure. That's God's heart. But we surrender to him. And he builds a beautiful life. And then we see that there's even hope. We can even receive grace after failure. Because we see after all of these warnings, Cain fails again. But this time, he fails big time. This time in verse 8, we, we read that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. At this point, it looks like Cain has gone past the point of no return. He has forever severed his relationship with his brother through the finality of death. Sin overcame him. He gave over to sin. He followed the promptings of his flesh. And out of this flowed this heinous crime of murder. Here's something amazing. Even after this, God gives him another chance to come clean. God asks him, Cain, where's your brother? Do you think God didn't know where his brother was? God knew. God asked him this question because he wanted a heart from Cain to say, God, I messed up. God, I can't believe what I did. But still in this, Cain chose to be defiant. He's coming to God and saying, am I my brother's keeper? See, after all this failure, we would have thought that God had written him off. We would have thought this is enough. He's failed too many times. But I thank God that we serve a gracious, merciful God who doesn't judge the way that man judges. Man might judge and say, he's taken an innocent life. He needs to die. He needs to suffer. But we see the heart of God with Jesus and this woman that they brought before him caught in adultery. When they accused him, Jesus said in John 8, 7, he who has no sin, throw the first stone. See, God knows that we struggle. It's not his heart that we should fail, but God knows that we struggle. And God is gracious and loving. And his heart is for us that he wants life. God doesn't want to kill you. God wants to forgive. God wants to bring hope. But what God does is he says, Cain, there's a penalty to sin. God declares a penalty on the sin. And the moment Cain comes face to face with a penalty 
for his sin, the result of it, something happens. At last, he realizes that my sin has horrific consequences. He has a moment when he comes to himself. And I read it in the text. When we read in verse 13 and 14, when he responds to what God tells him about the consequences. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you've driven me this day from the face of the ground and from your face I will be hidden. I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. I can hear the anxiety and the fear in his words as he at last understands that God's heart was for him to have a beautiful life. God's heart for him was to be healed. We know this from verse 6. When God gave him a choice, he said, if you do good, will you not find acceptance? I believe that there was a choice, that if Cain cho chose differently, his life could have been much different. But at last, he sees the consequence of his sin. And even though God banished him, that was actually merciful because it was a lesser sentence than he deserved. He deserved to die. But still, he does not stop here. We read that God says, okay, I will put a mark on you so no one will kill you. We see that God, even in this, gives him a hope and a future. Maybe it's not the perfect future. Maybe it isn't the perfect thing. But from this, we see that these consequences is still not the end. When he at last comes to God and says, God, I don't know. Cain did not die. The Bible says that Cain fathered a son and Cain built a city. There was still a heritage to Cain's life. I want to tell you in the New Testament we know in Romans 8, it says that God can make all things work together for our good, for those who love him. Even though you have failed, even though it might not be the perfect plan that you thought, God can still turn it around. Even the consequences of sin, you might carry the consequence of sin in this earth, in your mortal life, but God can still turn that around for a testimony and for good for his kingdom if you surrender to him. You've heard all the many stories of people Crimes committed, going to jail, finding Christ, and then using that as bringing hope to others. It's possible. God can turn it around. But we need something. We need a heart that is changed. We need a heart that says, God, my heart is deceitful above all else. I cannot trust my heart. I need a heart that follows after God, a heart that follows after his word. A heart that follows God's heart. Psalm 119, 11 says, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. This morning I've got hope for you. Failure is not the end. You might say, I have failed so many times. We see in the story of Cain that God's heart is to bring life from that. God's heart is that it can be turned around. If we surrender to God, if we lay down our pride and say, God, my worth is not in this. I want to find my worth in you. Build my life on your love. God, I want to stop running towards darkness and death. I want to stop running away from you. I want to turn around. I want to be inclined towards you. Inclined towards life. Inclined toward what you want for me. I lay down my heart. I lay down myself. And this morning I want to encourage you. There will still be times of failure. Don't run from God. Don't take the fork towards another failure. If you fail, run to God. Say, God, I don't know. I need your counsel. Let's be humble people that humble ourselves before the Lord, even in times of failure, so that he can turn this around into something beautiful. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you are such an amazing, wonderful, 
gracious, merciful God. That despite our wayward hearts many times, despite our hearts that we cannot trust, despite our failures, you do not throw us away. Thank you that you can even turn this around. And this morning I want to pray for those who have been led into the lie that my failures determine my worth. Lord, that you will this morning set us free, set every person free from that thing that drives them, that insecurity that drives us, sometimes even to, to being perfectionists, having to do everything perfect, otherwise I feel I'm not good enough. God, we want to lay this down before you. Thank you that we can lay our burdens down, that you take it upon yourselves and we can step in under your yoke that is light, that we can step in under your authority, step in under your leading, step in under your guidance, humble ourselves before you so that you can turn it around and make it beautiful. Lord, even our failures, we come and confess. Lord, if we've had this deep-seated anger and frustration, we come and confess it, lay it down before you. Pray that you will just come and turn this around. Thank you that you're a God of hope. It is not the end that you can still do beautiful things with our lives. We worship you and we honor you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.